This video was made possible thanks to the support of our amazing patrons. We couldn't do this without you. Don't forget that you can support the channel for free and receive 10% off orders over $10 of Flipside Gaming by using the promo code AFFINITY at the checkout. Or if TCG Player and Magic Madhouse are more your thing, then be sure to place your order through our affiliate links in the description. Once again, at no extra cost to yourselves. Hello everyone and welcome back to Affinity for Commander. My name is Alex and today we're deep diving into the lore behind two of the most famous siblings in all of magic, Will and Rowan. <laughs> no. I'm of course speaking about Kamal and Jessica. Their story takes place in the far-flung past of Dominaria, sometime before the mending occurred but after Urzrin, that whole mess. They were born in the Padric Mountains in the area known as Ataria. Both grew up in the common ways of the barbarians, but with Jessica having more of a technical mind than brute force like her brother. After growing up, Kamal decided he needed to leave his tribe in the mountains and enter the Cabal city and the famed pit fights. He did this to both hone his skills and be able to come back draped in glory. After some good initial old class-based discrimination, Kamal was granted entry into the pits and began a career as a fan-favorite fighter. Here, he also made two lifelong friends both of whom would come to change the course of his story in drastically different ways. Seton and the Dementia Summoner, Chena. It was, however, whilst getting into a tour of the prize hall that Kamal first set his sights on something that would come to dominate his mind, the Miari. A silver orb that appeared in Dominaria some time ago after Yorgmoth's invasion. It had the remarkable power to bring its holder's desires into being, but this would usually end with the wielder's untimely death. So think of a really, really shiny monkey's paw. The idea of gaining this artifact became Kamal's obsession, and yet time and time again, it was whisked away from his grasp. First by Lieutenant Kirtar, who took credit for one of Kamal's victories, and so took the Miari as its prize. This, in Dominaria culture, is referred to as a massive Richard relocation. The Miari was then taken by Laquitus of the Myrrh Empire, who just plain stole it whilst Kirtar was busy getting himself stuck in crystal. It was then promptly stolen back by Braids and returned back to the Cabal City. And so, after an incredibly frustrating gap year, Kamal returned to the fighting pits once again to compete for his shiny ball. Upon his return, he met back up with an old friend, Chainer, who had apparently been working out quite a lot in his time away. However, in a break from the fighting, the two decide to go on a boy's camping trip, have some beers, kill some animals, get into deep philosophical discussions about the nature of being and whether we actually have free choice or it's just our habitual tendencies leading us down a path we have no control over. You know, bro stuff. However, upon returning from their discount Brokeback Mountain, the pair find the city under attack by the Order, an organization that stretched across Ataria, whose central doctrine was the possession and destruction of powerful artifacts, after seeing the destruction such things brought about during the time of Yorgmoth. Kind of completely understandable, really. But anyway, back to the fighting. Kamal and Chena quickly join the side of the Cabal, considering they might be evil, but they do still run the city pretty well, keep the postal service going, and are also the people who are literally paying them. So they jumped into the fray. After doing their best Legolas and Gimli impression, Kamal was seriously injured by an order just to see her. Wishing to save his friend, and being incredibly lucky at the same time, Chena was able to find and use the Miari in the midst of the battle. Chena used the Miara to summon Snake Skin that could be grafted onto Kamal, in that instant both saving his friend's life and ensuring he's not making it past the halfway mark of this video. After awakening in the Cabal Hospital, Kamal is horrified to find his new scaly exterior and promptly burns away the grafted skin as it went against his barbarian beliefs, and Kamal does not use faith as a dumpstart. 
Once fully healed, Kamal ventured back into the city, only to find his once friend Chena now driven completely mad by the Miari. Kamal initially tried to talk to his friend, but this had no effect, and the two came to blows, with Chena even completely losing himself and transforming into a huge mass of horror creatures. In the fight, however, Kamal came out as victorious, and Shayna, just before his death, gifted the fighter with the Miari he was holding on to. Kamal took the artifact and fixed it to the hilt of his sword, hoping to guard it against those that would ever seek it again. Upon her brother's final return to the tribe, Jessica could see something wasn't quite right, let's say. He was more aggressive and demanded more. After becoming the chief of the land, he sought to extend his power, taking control of other areas in the mountain. It was during a skirmish for such lands that Kamal, still wielding his Miari-laden sword, went completely berserk, cutting down his own men and enemies alike. Jessica, after trying to stop her brother, was unfortunately, um, uh, stabbed through the chest by her brother. Oh, it's getting awfully Shakespearean in here. However, after quickly snapping from his rage and realizing what he'd done, Kamal took Jessica and rushed into the forest of Crosa, hoping to find someone to help heal his sister. It was unfortunately as the former pit fighter was running, he is set upon by more order forces still after the Miari. However, in a now completely blatant ripoff from that scene in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Seton bursts into the scene and saves Kamal and Jessica. Seton offers to take Jessica to safety as Kamal leads away his pursuers deeper into the forest. So, that's what he does. Seton runs off, taking Jessica to safety and well-being. Literally two minutes later. Braids appears, slaps Seton, and takes Jessica prisoner. You had one job. One job. Jessica was then taken to the Cabal Patriarch to be killed. However, Jessica's plot armor is so thick at this point that not even the death touch of Vyot Maglan could kill her. Instead, it transformed her into phage, a being whose mere touch to organic matter caused it to decay and die. After working with the Cabal as a fighter and assassin for some time, Phage eventually left the shady organization to help a young woman named Zaroka within the Cabal city, helping refugees from the battles outside the city. But as any John Wick fan will tell you, your old life has a way of catching up to you. One of the people Phage killed was Nevea, the wife of Ixidor, a powerful mage. In his grief, Ixidor conjured up a chroma, a sentinel illusion in the image of his wife. Bearing the same rage as her creator, Akroma tracked down Phage to get revenge for Nevea's death, just in case it wasn't getting Freudian enough here for you. So upon successfully tracking down Phage, we now have a fight between an even darker gender-swapped King Minidas, an illusionary yet very real angel, and a human bystander who just kind of wanted to get food for people really. But before all that, let's check back in with Kamal. After leaving Jessica in the completely safe care of Seton, Kamal journeyed deep into the Crozen Forest, still holding on to his Miyari-laden sword. Here, he met a very old and very powerful Nantuko named Thriss. Thriss tried to convince Kamal to renounce his rage-filled barbarian ways and join the Druids and adopt a peaceful life in tune with nature. Kamal strangely took this ideology rather quickly. It was also said that he was using this new druidic knowledge to look for a means of healing his sister from the wound he gave her. And so Kamal started to become entwined in the druidic way of life. This was unfortunately interrupted by Laquitus. The merfolk, still possessed by his desire for the Miari, had tracked Kamal for weeks on end to find his desired artifact. The two quickly came to blows, Kamal's barbaric instincts once again taking over. Kamal, however, ended the fight by plunging his sword through the merfolk's chest, embedding his foe and the Miyari into the earth of the forest. Kamal took this as his final violent act, renouncing his sword, the Miyari, and his barbaric ways. Which actually lasts surprisingly a long time. 
But it just wouldn't be an MTG story without horrifically weird violence. Not a good one anyway. So after years of being in a deep tree nap, Kamala's awoken by Bronn the Chad Stonebrow, and essentially told, hey, your sister's kind of the year of evil and is killing people, so you might want to go have a word. Upon hearing this, Kamal picks up the Soul Reaper, his loot from a subquest B, and rushes to his sister. And this is the scene he finds, an angel barreling down on Jessica who's going through a super goth phase. Kamal resolves himself to end this entire business once and for all, and swings the Soul Reaper, killing Akroma, Phage, and Zagorka as well. Now, I don't want to take the triple kill away from you, that was pretty sweet, but if you could stop mortally wounding your sister, that would be great. This, however, was not the end of Jessica. With the death of these three women, their essences coalesced into one being, Krona, goddess of magic. A being of immeasurable power that had once existed on Dominaria, but was simply looking for a way to return to the plane physically, and the freed essence of three strong-willed and powerful women was just the ticket. Krona, however, needed some time alone to understand this whole nigh-omnipotence thing, so she blew away everyone around her, including Kamal, and flew away. After some brief deliberation and a whole lot of just random murder, she decided she wanted to know other things about the beings like her, her equals, people she could have a dialogue with. So she looked into each colour of mana, and through portals she conjured she saw Teferi for white, Lawin for blue, Yorgmoth for black, Freys for red, and Multani for green. Quick disclaimer, this meeting has been slightly retconned, mainly with the Wizards of the Coast saying that these were just manifestations of the colours of mana on Dominaria, not literally these people, especially since Yorkmoth at this point is a bit busy being very dead. Anyway, back to the story. Krona, after seeing this, and in an act of ultimate sass, decided none were her equal, so set about Kratosing all the gods. That is to say, killing them because reasons. This plan, however, was stopped by her one-third brother Kamal, who, after going on a side quest involving a mutated dead merfolk, he was able to retrieve his Miari sword from Krosa. Charging headlong into Krona, Kamal swung his sword and was immediately backhanded away, because literal goddess of magic. Thankfully, however, Krona had taken to the liking of two unmen, who are nothing if not fickle creatures, so betrayed our goddess and stabbed her in the back with the Miari sword. This act of literal backstabbery killed Corona, as well as a Chroma and Zagrok that had been making up her body. Jessica, however, was not slain by this act, although she is definitely getting some points on her frequently stabbed loyalty card. Instead, it was at this instant that her planeswalker spark activated. So, finally, the day is kind of saved. Kamal is now a druid, Jessica's back and healthy and now planeswalker, the entire continent of Atari is kind of on fire. But other than that, everything worked out pretty well. Then, however, a certain silver golem appears. Khan indeed pops his head back into Dominaria, hearing about all the commotion, and notices the Miari. He explains the metal's humble origins, and asks for it back to take it to the new plane he's been creating, called Argentium. Kamal more than agrees, handing over the orb to the golem. Khan, also noticing Jessica, volunteers to be her mentor in the ways of being a planeswalker. Now, with some relative peace returned to the continent, the two siblings part ways, wishing each other well on their own paths. Kamal returns to the Crozen Forest, and Jessica planeswalks away with Khan to this new hip plain of Argentium, where absolutely nothing goes wrong, ever, at all. Following this parting, not a lot is known about Kamal. It is, however, assumed that he lived out the rest of his days in peace within the Croson Forest, practicing his druidic way of life and protecting it from those that would do it harm. The same, however, cannot be said for his sister. Jessica spent her immortal, powerful life traveling around the multiverse, 
until at one time she needed to find her mentor Khan and return to Dominaria. Upon doing so and meeting up with Teferi, she learned the trouble the plane was currently in, which is to say, a lot. Rifts had begun to open across the plane, threatening to completely tear it apart, and with it being the centre of the multiverse, caused a chain reaction decimating the entire multiverse. Jessica, upon hearing this, and calling Teferi's plan stupid, she went out to stop the rifts herself. With the help, sometimes unwilling help, of other planeswalkers and several powerful beings, including Nicol Bolas at one point, Jessica was able to close off most of the rifts over Dominaria. The last one, however, was over Otaria, and was tied to Corona's death and birth. You see, the rifts were occurring due to the world-ending events that were taking place across the multiverse, including acts of the godlike planeswalkers, with each rift being tied to a specific event or person. So Jessica, our hero of the story, teleports to the heart of the rift, confronts Corona, wins her battle, and pushes out her power across the rift and beyond. She influences all other rifts caused across the multiverse, and with one final discharge of power, Jessica collapses the rifts and allows the beginning of the Great Mending, sacrificing herself in the process. After this, Jessica awakens in a white void and sees her brother Kamal welcoming her. She takes his hand and finally reunited, they both welcome a sweet, peaceful, white oblivion. And that will be the end of the video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. What other characters or events would you like us to cover in the next Law of the Land? Whatever your thoughts, leave them in the comments below. As always, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video, and click the bell icon as YouTube are not great at letting you know when our videos come out. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at 4Commander, and if you really like us, you could consider becoming a patron of the channel yourself for access to exclusive EDH-related rewards. As always, I have been Alex, and I will see you next time.